Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Come Follow Me Made Easier podcast. I'm Casey Griffiths, and I'm the author of 50 Relics of the Restoration. And this week, I get to talk to you a little bit about one of my favorite books in the Old Testament. That's the book of Job. Uh, So a little bit of background first. Uh, The book of Job is part of a set of books in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is kind of arranged as a series of libraries. So there's the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch, and then you have the histories, and then you have the uh, wisdom literature, which features Proverbs, and then Psalms, and then Job. You also have Ecclesiastes mixed in there too, and each one of them kind of presents this complicated but beautiful approach to understanding God and how God works with us. Now, The book of Job is an interesting contrast to the two that come before it, because Proverbs is very black and white. God is good. God blesses people that are righteous. God condemns people that are wicked. If you do good things, good things will happen to you. If you do bad things, bad things will happen to you. Then you get to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is a little bit muddier. The writer of Ecclesiastes basically says, all is vanity, life is vanity, whatever you try to do, it's sort of pointless but serve God because it's the right thing to do. He doesn't have as much of a dichotomy of if you do good, God will bless you. If you do bad, God won't bless you. He's just basically saying, we know it's right to serve God, so go and serve him. The book of Job presents maybe an even more difficult question, which is how come righteous people have bad things happen to them? Um, the book itself is really unique because we don't know very much about its time frame or its setting. We're not even 100% sure if this is history or if it's literature. And to be honest with you, it shows elements of both. Uh, for instance, it talks about Job and the way that it describes Job makes it sound like he lives in the era of the patriarchs. Because uh, like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, it describes his his belongings in terms of um, sheep and camels and his livestock and his servants. And it doesn't sound like he's part of a larger nation, but that they're still living this kind of familial model where Job and his wife and his kids are the whole world that surrounds them. Um, Now, there is evidence that Job is a real person. For instance, Jesus refers to Job as a real person in section 121 of the Doctrine and Covenants. He tells Joseph Smith, thou art not yet as Job, which makes it sound like he's not talking about a fictional character, but someone that really endured something. And so it's possible. In fact, I would say I believe that Job was a real person that underwent some serious, serious trials and remain faithful to God. But there's also a lot of touches in the book that make it sound like this has been embellished in order for us to explore the question of why bad things happen to good people. For instance, um, the writer opens up by saying, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. Uh, This is a very vague setting. It doesn't mention that Job is an Israelite, which most of the Old Testament is focused on. Uh, It speaks in general terms, and it kind of has this This framing device where God and Satan or the Satan, depending on how you look at it, have this discussion. I don't think that God has discussions where he allows uh, people to suffer just because he's trying to prove a point to somebody else. That seems like a fictional framing device to set us up for the story. And yet at the same time, too, there's these beautiful long dialogues in the book between Job and Job's friends, between God and Job. They keep going back to this question of why do we do what's right? And do we do it just because we're expecting to be rewarded? In fact, let me bring up a a quote here that was shared in the last general conference by D. Todd Christofferson. I love this quote. He said, some misunderstand the promises of God to mean that obedience to him yields specific outcomes on a fixed schedule. They might think if I diligently serve a full-time mission, God will bless me with a happy marriage and children. Or if I refrain from doing schoolwork on the Sabbath, God will bless me with good grades. Or if I pay tithing, God will bless me with the job that I've been wanting. If life doesn't fall out precisely this way or according to an expected timetable, they may feel betrayed by God. But things are not so mechanical in the divine economy. We ought not to think of God's plan as a cosmic vending machine where we select the desired blessing, insert the required sum of good works, and the order is promptly delivered. Now, what the book of Job is testing here is what happens 
when our view of that divine vending machine breaks down. Because the writer of the book of Job emphasizes several times Job hasn't done anything wrong. In fact, go with me to Job chapter 1, verse 1, and this sets up the idea. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was perfect and upright, not words that you hear very often affixed to anybody other than Jesus Christ, one that feared God and eschewed evil. So Job is a good guy. They open the story by saying Job is a good guy. Then mentions all of his substance. There were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance was also 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camel, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she donkeys, a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. And his sons went and feasted in their houses every one his day, and sent and called their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So he is doing great. He's doing great. And he's doing great because he's so righteous. He's a good guy who strives to live the commandments and has been fortunate because of it. Now, from that introduction in verse six, the scene immediately shifts. And it shifts in a way that's particularly meaningful to Latter day Saints because it sets up this kind of uh, divine counsel. Um, It says, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Now, a lot of scholars will point out that the word used here, Satan, or as it would have been pronounced in Hebrew, Satan, may or may not be the Satan that we're used to talking about. Um, Satan is a Hebrew word that means the accuser. You'll note if you read texts about Lucifer, like section 76, it talks about how he became Satan, that his name's Lucifer, which means the bringer of light, but he becomes Satan, which means the accuser. Or uh, think of him as kind of like a prosecuting attorney or someone that just stirs things up. So God is sitting there meeting with the sons of God. And by the way, this view that God has a kind of divine counsel that he holds discussions with actually hedges really close to the Latter-day Saint view of how God operates. In the book of Abraham, for instance, it talks about a council that gets together and decides to create the earth, that has a discussion about the best um, means to bring about salvation, and then councils together about the best way to create the earth. This is an iteration of that council. The sons of God aren't any kind of um, vague beings. These are the children of God who, in our view, are involved in these discussions. Now, I don't know if God still holds court with Satan and debates back and forth with him. That's why I'm not totally sure that this is the Satan that we're talking about. But again, this is probably all just a framing device to set us up that question that we have of why bad things happen to good people. So it says this, the Lord said unto Satan, whence comest thou? Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth, from walking up and down in him. And the Lord said unto Satan, hast thou considered my servant Job? There is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. So even God is pointing at Job and saying, have you seen anybody that's better than him. He He's a perfect man. God calls Job perfect, meaning at the opening of the narrative, they're just insisting to us, Job's a good guy. He hasn't done anything wrong. Um, that's going to set up the complicated philosophical questions that we spend the next few chapters uh, wrestling with. Satan answered the Lord and said, doth Job fear God for not? Hast thou not made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? And hast thou blessed the work of his hands and his substance increased in the land? But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. In other words, Satan basically tells God, the only reason why Job likes you so much is because you've been so good to him. Job is working the system, basically. He's just doing what you want him to do so that he can receive blessings in return. It's this dichotomy of a cosmic vending machine. If you stop blessing Job, he'll stop liking you. In fact, he'll openly curse you to your face. And this sets up maybe the second big question of the book of Job. After why do bad things happen to good people? It's what motivates us to be righteous? Do we keep the commandments just because we think there's an eternal reward for us or that we think there's a reward here on earth? Do you go to church and pay your tithing? Do you read your scriptures just because you want blessings? Or do you do it for a kind of deeper reason that you would still do even if you didn't have the blessings. Now, I don't know where you're at personally. I I think in my behavior, there still is this element of, oh my gosh, if I don't read my scriptures and pray this morning, 
I'm not going to have a good day. Or uh, because I teach religion, if I don't read my scriptures and pray, I won't have the spirit with me going into the classroom. Uh, Job and God have this great relationship. And all Satan is saying is he's only nice to you because you're nice to him. If you took away all these blessings, human nature will manifest itself and he will curse you to your face. And so the Lord, again, again, I think this is a framing device, actually says, behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. So, all right, let's test this proposition. Now, I don't think that the Lord has these kinds of discussions with Satan. Again, I think this is a literary framing device to help us deal with a couple of questions here. But it also does raise the question of what's our allegiance to God and where does it come from? Just because he's good to us, if he stopped being good to us or bad things happen to us, would we lose our allegiance to God? Is it just a transactional relationship or is it something a little bit deeper? Now, this is where the tragedy strikes in the book of Job. Verse 14, there came a messenger unto Job that said, thy oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them and the Sabaeans fell upon them, took them away. They've slain thy servants with the edge of the sword and I, I alone am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, the fire of God has fallen from heaven, hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell me. And while he was yet speaking, this is just boom, boom, boom. One servant runs in after the other. There came another and said, the Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and carried them away and slain thy servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And while he was yet speaking, and this is the most devastating blow, there came another and said, thy sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in thy eldest brother's house. There came a great wind from the wilderness. It smote the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young men and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell me. So imagine if in five minutes, your house burned down and your car was destroyed. And then the most devastating blow of all, you lost your loved ones. You lost the people that you cared the most about. Job's response, Job arose. This is verse 20, rent his mantle, shaved his head, fell down on the ground and worshiped and said, naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, the Lord hath taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. So as difficult as this is to imagine, Job passes the first test. Uh, He's lost everything, including his children, which must have been devastating, but he acknowledges one simple truth. Everything that he had was given to him by God to begin with. If God took those things away, or if God just chose not to intervene when those things were being taken away, he still loves God and will stay faithful and true to God. Now, that is a great story in and of itself. We could end it here. It'd be a little sad, but Job passes the test of integrity. He doesn't curse God like Satan said he would. He stays close to God. So, Round two, flip to chapter two. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, from whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord, this whole dialogue again, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. The Lord said unto Satan, hast thou considered my servant Job? There is none like him in the earth, perfect and upright. They just repeat this whole dialogue. But then the Lord adds, not only does he fear God and eschew evil, but he holdeth fast to his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. Now, Satan brings up a second argument. Well, you've destroyed everything that Job has, but you haven't done anything to Job. You didn't let me actually inflict pain on the man himself. But he says this, skin for skin, all that man hath, he will give for his life. Put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thy hand, but save his life. In other words, do what you have to do, but don't take his life away. And this is where the second test comes in. Verse 7, So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord, and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. He took a potsherd to scrape himself with all and sat down among the ashes, and then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. Now, just so you know a little bit, I don't know if any of you out there have ever had boils, but to have boils from the sole of your foot under the crown of your head would be unbelievably 
painful. So painful that you have these open sores on your skin. It says in verse eight, he took a pot shard that is an actual shard of pottery and scraped himself off among it and sat down among the ashes. Now, boils to this degree wouldn't just be incredibly unpleasant for Job personally, but unpleasant for the people around him. Uh, the smell, the pain, the the look of what he must have looked like uh, sitting there in sackcloth and ashes caused even his wife to turn against him. And boy, imagine a worse test than losing your children. Uh, imagine your spouse, the person that you care most about here on earth, telling you there's no point anymore. Why don't you turn against God? God, God hasn't done anything for you. You haven't been protected. Curse God and then die. It's over. Job responds to her. Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? And in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. So Job again responds to this idea of, do you think that I just loved God because he was good to me? If, if God only does good things to me, I love him. But if God chooses to no longer do those good things and inflict pain on me, I still love him. Job at this point indicates that his relationship with God was not just transactional. He didn't see God as a cosmic vending machine who just dispensed blessings once he put the right amount of effort or change in. Job saw God as someone who genuinely cares about him, and Job trusts in him. Now, this is where the, the book shifts a little bit. Now, if we had just told this story, it's still a beautiful story about a man who endures a significant test. Uh, maybe the worst test found in the scriptures because Job actually has to give up his child. Abraham was asked to sacrifice his child, which is a horrific test, and this isn't a contest. Uh, but in the end, he gets to retain Isaac. Job gives up his family, uh, loses his own health, but still retains his integrity, his belief in God, his trust in God. And this is where the book shifts. Um, it mentions here in verse 11 that three friends heard what had happened to Job. They came unto him, everyone in his own place. And these are all non-Israelites. It goes out of its way to say, this is just taking us away from all the familiar settings, places, and people in the Bible to just let us have a discussion in a place undistracted about the nature of good and evil and righteousness and badness. He says this, the friends are Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuite, and Zophar the Namathite, for they made an appointment to come together and mourn with him and comfort him. And actually, I got to admit, um, I love these three guys. Uh, at the same time, um, if there's so many good places in the book of Job, it says this, verse 12, when they lifted their eyes afar off and knew him not, he's so disfigured, they don't know who he is. They lifted up their voice and wept. They ran everyone his mantle and sprinkled dust upon their heads toward heaven. And they sat down with him upon the ground seven days and seven nights. And none spake a word unto him, for they saw that his grief was very great. That's touching to me. Um, they don't initially, at least for seven days and seven nights, try to give any justification or even say anything. They just sit there and mourn with Job. Uh, these friends show up and don't do anything except be close to him and let him know that they're there for him. And even if our opinion of them shifts a little bit later as they get into these discussions, their first act is just exceedingly noble, that they're not trying to do anything to correct Job. They're just going to be there with him to mourn with those that mourn. And that is very noble of Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar. Uh, good guys. Now, the book shifts gears when you go to chapter three. And chapter three, up to about uh, chapter 38 or so, is a series of discussions where Job and his three friends are lamenting what's happened to Job and discussing human experience and why bad things happen to good people. Now, while Job is earnest and upright, he's also not as black and white a character as the first two chapters present him to be. Um, Job's initial response to all these trials is, God gave, God hath taken away, um, shall we receive good at the hand of God and not receive evil, and he doesn't sin. But when Job actually has a chance to sit down with his friends, it's clear that the events that have happened have devastated him. And he is really, really struggling to know 
why this happens, or even if he can go on after all this has happened. In fact, uh, go to chapter 3, verse 1, and Job has this big monologue. I'll just share a couple highlights of it from you as we go through this, where he laments what happened. Verse 3, let the day perish wherein I was born, and the night in which it was said, there is a man-child conceived. Uh, why was I even born? And in fact, verse 11, why died I not from the womb? Why did I not give up the ghost when I came out of the belly? Verse 25, for the thing which I greatly feared has come upon me, and that which I was afraid of has come unto me. I was not in safety, neither had I rest, neither was I quiet, yet trouble came. This is Job saying, I was doing everything I was supposed to do. Why has this happened to me? Um, why was I even put on earth if I was going to have to endure these significant pains? So Job's not just questioning God, he's questioning his own purpose for being. And it's okay, I think, in the sense to show that Job is a human and has a little bit of weakness. The great thing about him is his initial response to the trials that he goes through is that he trusts God. But now that it's had some time to soak in, he is sitting there questioning his own existence and how miserable he is, and if he can ever be happy again, and why this happened to him when he was doing what he was supposed to be doing. So there is a little bit of that cosmic bending machine found in there. And throughout these chapters, Job is going to go back and forth between putting hope in God to sometimes saying maybe God is cruel, to just trying to work his way through the confusion surrounding this. Now, Job's three friends represent what was kind of the best thinking of the day on good and evil when the time the book of Job was written. But all their arguments basically boil down to God is good and God blesses the righteous and you've had bad things happen to you, so you must have done something wrong. They go out of their way to question Job and say, are you sure you didn't do this? Are you sure you didn't do this? And their basic thesis is, well, God blesses the righteous and punishes the wicked, so you must have done something wrong. They're stuck in the kind of cosmic vending machine mindset as well. So to give you an example, go to Job chapter four, and this is probably a good short summary of everything they say. Uh, one of Job's friends speak to him, remember, I pray thee, whoever perished being innocent, or where were the righteous cut off? Even if I've seen they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. By the blast of God they perish, and by the breath of his nostrils are they consumed. So this is, in summary, this argument they go back and forth through. There's actually three cycles where the friends get an opportunity to make the same argument. God blesses the righteous and punishes the wicked. So Job, you must have done something wrong. What did you do that was wrong? And Job has the chance to answer and say, I didn't do anything wrong. I don't know why this has happened. I can't explain what's going on, which is that simple logic that the good get blessings and the wicked receive retribution. In fact, there's a few places in here, probably the most important passages where Job admits he doesn't really know why this is happening, but he still has hope for the future. And again, he goes back and forth between having hope and saying, I don't know why hope and despair are present in Job. But let's look at a couple places where he expresses hope. So they've just accused him of being an enemy of God. Let's flip to Job chapter 13. Go to Job chapter 13, verse 13. And this is at the end of another round of the friend saying, Job, you must have done something wrong else all this bad stuff wouldn't have happened to you. Just fess up. Tell us what happened. Job in verse 13 of chapter 13, hold your peace. Let me alone that I may speak. Let come on me what will. Wherefore do I take my flesh in my teeth and put my life in mine hand? Though he, this is God, slay me, yet I will trust in him, but I will maintain mine own ways before him. He also shall be my salvation, for an hypocrite shall not come before him. Hear diligently my speech and my declaration with your ears. And behold, now I've ordered my cause, and I know that I shall be justified. Job is saying, I still trust in God. I still believe that I'm going to be justified, that the things that I've done and I've done nothing wrong show that I love and trust God. And I think in the end, I'll get a reward because of it. So he's moving away from the cosmic vending machine a little bit by saying, I don't know when and I don't know how, 
but I know that eventually I'm going to receive my just rewards because I've done what I'm supposed to do. So maybe a first step in dealing with this cosmic vending machine mindset is asking ourselves, does it always work in our timing? Do we want things when we want them right now? And that's not necessarily always how God works. A lot of times we can't understand God's timing and why he sends us the blessings. You might remember that phrase that Elder Holland shared a long time ago in his talk where he said, the blessings of heaven may not come in this life, but they do eventually come. This is Job saying, all right, things are terrible right now, but I know who God is and I know what he's like and I know what he does and I know that he is going to bless and help me, that in the end, I'll be proven correct. Now, again, Job isn't perfect in the sense that he goes back and forth with this and tries to come up with alternate explanations. But a common theme that keeps running through the work is that he believes and trusts in God. So let's go and look at a passage where Job despairs a little bit. Go to Job chapter 14 now, and let's start in verse 1. Man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. He cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. He fleeth as a shadow and continueth not. And dost thou open thine eyes upon such an one and bringest me into judgment with thee? Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. If a man die, shall he live again? In all the days of my appointed time will I wait till my charge come. Thou shalt call and I will answer. Thou wilt have a desire to the work of thine hands. So this is Job just basically saying, look, life is difficult. We know that it's difficult and it's short and it's trouble. But if we trust in God and we answer his call when he comes, will find purpose and meaning in life. In other words, it's not that life is supposed to be easy, but there's beauty in the struggles we have in life in finding our way and using those struggles to make us better, to make us whole. And then we get to probably the most beautiful dialogue in the entire book of Job. So he's running through all these arguments. His friends just keep banging the drum on this refrain. The righteous get blessings and the wicked get punishments. So Job, you must be Wicked, there's no other way to explain what happened to you when you go to Job 19, where again, Job has to respond to his friends by saying, I didn't do anything wrong. Go to Job chapter 19, verse 22. And this is probably the most beautiful passage. And what's a really beautiful uh, poetic book? Job says to his friends, verse 22, chapter 19, why do you persecute me as God and are not satisfied with my flesh? Oh, that my words are now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book, that they were graven with an iron pen and led in rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand of the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh, I shall see God. In other words, when everything is taken away from us, when we get to the point to where we just really have nothing, it's all been stripped away. For Job, it was this last promise that he knows he has a redeemer. Verse 19, I know that my redeemer liveth and that he shall stand with the latter day upon this earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh, I shall see God. A beautiful passage that points us towards the day when everything will eventually work out. A person of faith that believes in God can endure horrible, horrible, terrible things, terrific trials, but still know that there is a reward coming, that there is a redeemer that loves us and cares about us, and that the world is just. There's this old Martin Luther King quote that I love where he says, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And a person of faith just has to believe that God eventually does his works, but maybe not in our in our timing. We, we can't expect an immediate gratification for the things that we've done. Sometimes it takes a long time for us to have the blessings that come. Job here is saying, I know that eventually I'll see God in my flesh, that this body that he's in, which has been desiccated, which has been just ruined, is going to eventually be restored and even be better and bring him before God. So they go back and forth in all these discussions. When you get to uh, around chapter 32, 
uh, a third person, a young man named Elihu. It's interesting because nobody in the book of Job has a Hebrew sounding name except Elihu. Elihu shows up on the scene and he's a young man who's holding his words while the other men speak. And Elihu basically steps up and interjects himself in the discussion. But all Elihu basically says is we know God is good. So there's got to be a way to resolve this. He even goes so far as to say God is good. So maybe he's using these experiences, Job, to help you be prepared for something or because of something that you haven't done yet that you're going to do in the future. They just go back and forth again with this discussion. The pattern is, is that the three friends and Elihu basically keep coming back to Job. You must've done something wrong. And Job keeps saying, I've done nothing wrong. I have faith that things eventually will work out. I just trust God that that will happen. And then another person enters into the discussion. Uh, Go to chapter 38. And this is where God actually interjects himself into the discussion and has the opportunity to speak. Now, the way it introduces God is kind of unique here. It says that God speaks to Job out of the whirlwind. So a storm, uh, imagine, or I don't know exactly how this uh, would look, but the Lord speaks to Job and starts to, well, the frustrating thing here is he doesn't answer his question. The book of Job doesn't have any easy answers to any of these questions. It's more raising these questions so that we're thinking deeply about them. But Job's already said, I don't know if my timing aligns with God's timing, but I trust that one day it will. Then the Lord speaks to Job and starts to raise a couple questions. Says this, the Lord answered Job out of the world. And this is chapter 38. Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. So instead of answering Job's question, God actually starts to ask Job questions. Uh, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest, or who stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now, in these uh, verses, in fact, this goes on chapters 38, 39, uh, 40, and 41, the Lord just basically makes the point of saying, Job, are you sure that you have enough knowledge to know why I do the things that I do? I wouldn't take this as a stern rebuke. In fact, in the chapters, God goes into great, great detail about things around the world, how it works. He even talks about how sheep and goats are fed. But he's trying to pull Job back and say, do you actually know why I do the things that I do? Or is your perspective limited? And that's why it's so important for you to trust in me. It's really difficult for a person that lives on earth with their limited perspective and the smaller world that they live in to see the grand designs of the universe and understand why God made the universe the way that he did. Now, that's the general gist of these messages, but we tend to focus also on chapter 38, uh, verses 4 through 7, because for Latter-day Saints, this has an even deeper meaning as we go. We already mentioned the Latter-day Saints should be totally comfortable with the idea that God has this council of the sons of God that he sits to and speaks about and has discussions with. But what adds to our insight here as Latter-day Saints is when he says, where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth, declared if thou hast understanding, there's a deeper meaning there. What we believe is that we were there when God laid the foundations of the earth, that God isn't hypothetically asking Job, you weren't even there when we laid the foundations of the earth. In fact, what's revealed to us is that we were there when God laid the foundations of the earth, that the foundations of the earth and the plan that we exist and live in are all things that we agreed to before we came here. So just like the book of Abraham is enlightening in informing us that there's a council beforehand, or a council that God speaks and works with, if you go to Abraham chapter 3, it actually mentions that this whole thing wasn't arbitrary, that it was collaborative, that God didn't just set up the world and say, you're going to go down and you're going to suffer and it's going to be really tough. He had a discussion with us so that we would know. Job is being hearkened back to premortality, which he might not remember at this point because of the veil, but God's reminding him, hey, 
this suffering that you're enduring and this world that you feel so bad about right now is actually something that you signed up for. Um, let's do a quick side leap to Abraham chapter three. This is something that's shown to Abraham, another person famous for enduring a test of faith. It says, now the Lord had shown unto me, Abraham, the intelligences that were organized before the world was. And among all these, there were many of the noble and great ones. And God saw these souls that they were good and said, these I will make my rulers for he stood among the spirits. And he saw that they were good. And he said unto me, Abraham, thou art one of them that was chosen before thou was born. You could easily take out Abraham and substitute Job's name in here. And the whole thing still works. In fact, with the light of Latter-day Revelation, that's what God is saying to Job. You were there. You were one of the intelligences that was there when I formed the world. You knew what you were doing. It also mentions, there stood one unto them that was like unto God. This is Jesus Christ. And he said unto those who are with him, we will go down for there is space there. We will take of these materials and we will make an earth whereon these may dwell. And we will prove them herewith to see if they will do all things whatsoever the Lord their God shall command them. Now, if we go back to Job chapter 38, using what we know about pre-mortality and what God said to Abraham, the passage takes on different meaning. Because when, when Christians normally read this passage, it's God saying, I'm here with my counsel and you don't know what I'm doing. Uh, you just have to trust in me. With Latter-day Saint understanding of a pre-mortal existence and that the creation of the earth wasn't just something that God did and that Jesus did, but it was a collaborative creation that they actually sat down and explained everything before we came here. This passage takes on new meaning. Where was that when I laid the foundations of the earth? Job was there. He knew what was the what was, what was the purpose of earth life? That there would be suffering entailed in it. Who hath laid the measures thereof if thou knowest, and who hath stretched thy line upon it? The implication from our knowledge of pre-mortality is that Job could have been one of the people that laid the measures thereof. Whereon the foundations thereof are fastened, he helped fasten the foundations. And then verse 7 takes on deeper meaning. When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Instead of the sons of God being this distant counsel from Job, our understanding of premortality helps us know that Job was one of those sons of God. That Job was there and he agreed to the whole thing. And the Lord even points out that you shouted for joy when you learned about this plan. You understood what the plan was at that time. Now, we also need to acknowledge, though, that there can be a difference between understanding a plan and experiencing a plan. We've all had those moments where you decided to go on a hike or start a big project. You decided to write a book and in the middle of it, you realize this is a lot tougher than I had conceived it to be. And that might be what the Savior's point is in all these verses. Job, you agreed to this, but in your perspective, where you're at right now, I recognize that it's really tough for you to understand how complex this whole system is. And that might be the focus of the dialogue from 38 to 41, that the Lord's trying to tell him, look, life is big and mysterious, and you might not always know or understand what the answers are, but I need you to trust in me. In fact, there's um, a, a little weirdness in the book of Job, but again, I kind of like the weirdness uh, that the Lord starts to, in um, chapter 40, point out this thing called the behemoth, which is like this big, grand land creature. We don't know exactly who, what it is. Some scholars have speculated the Lord was talking about a hippo, which is big and dangerous, or it could be a kind of mythological creature. At any rate, it's a behemoth. The Lord points to the behemoth and says, it's big and it's powerful, but it's also scary and dangerous. Then in chapter 41, he points to the Leviathan which some people have said could be a crocodile or a whale, um, but is probably just a symbolic creature to express the dangers of the sea. So the behemoth expresses it's dangerous to live on land. It's dangerous to live in the sea. Life is dangerous. Sometimes bad things are going to happen to you. Sometimes bad things are going to happen to the people that you love. But like the Leviathan and the behemoth, these things are big and majestic and beautiful and dangerous because you can't control them. It seems like the point that he's trying to make here with Job is life is big and beautiful, and it has wonderful, thrilling things. Like if the Leviathan is supposed to be a whale, uh, some of us have been there and seen 
a whale or seen videos of a whale and how big and majestic they are. And yet when you're there in that moment and you see them, there is a little bit of fear because they're so powerful that it feels like they could just slap you to the side with little to no effort. He's likening this to life. And the central point seems to be, Job, I know the bad things have happened to you, but don't question me because you don't see the big picture and how everything works. You don't necessarily understand how all the pieces fit together. So I'm going to ask that you trust in me and help me along the way. Um, I'd like to uh, take a minute and, and maybe modernize this story. Um, we all will have moments in our life when we lose things and people uh, that we love. And to me, the most heartaching thing about the story of the book of Job isn't that he loses his property, though that would be difficult. We've, we've had moments when it feels like our livelihood is going to be threatened. We're going to lose a job or lose our house. And those can be terrifying nights when we stay up and can't sleep. But to me, the most gut-wrenching thing is that Job loses his family members. He loses his children that he loves dearly. His wife turns against him. Um, if I were to cite an example of maybe a modern day Job, uh, the person that comes to mind is Richard G. Scott. Uh, Elder Scott passed away in 2015, and there's a tendency for us to just move on really quickly to the next thing. But over a 20 year period, back like the last 20 years of his life, Richard G. Scott acted out this kind of divine drama, a, a sort of modern day book of Job uh, in front of the entire church. Some of you that might remember Elder Scott speaking in conference will note how often Richard G. Scott spoke about his wife, Janine. Uh, his wife, Janine, passed away in 1995. And the last 20 years of Richard G. Scott's life, he was alone and he frequently talked about his wife and how much she meant to him. And this is a guy who was, uh, well, he was, he was a tough guy. Uh, Richard G. Scott was a nuclear physicist. He was very, very smart, spoke several languages and knew how to handle um, trials, but also would get teary when he started speaking about his wife. Now, I want to go to a talk that Elder Scott gave in October 1995. This talk was given right after his wife had passed, and it introduces a theme that Elder Scott returned to again and again for 20 or so odd years after his wife had passed away. This talk, by the way, is called Trust in the Lord. It's from the October 1995 General Conference talk. And just knowing the backstory, I hope these words of Richard Scott become a little bit more poignant to you. He said, just when all seems to be going right, challenges come in multiple doses applied simultaneously. When those trials are not consequences of your disobedience, they are evidence that the Lord's fields you're prepared to grow more. So he's going beyond this whole the righteous get blessed, the wicked get punished. Maybe the reason why bad things sometimes happen to good people is because the Lord wants you to grow. That it's not always a blessing to get every single thing that you want. That sometimes the blessing is to not get what you want or endure trials because the Lord's trying to refine you. He says this, he gives you experiences that stimulate growth and compassion, which polish you for your everlasting benefit. To get you from where you are to where he wants you to be requires a lot of stretching, and that generally entails discomfort and pain. Just making a good point that change and growth are difficult. You've heard the phrase growing pains. Well, that's because the most difficult times in our life are usually the times when we experience the greatest amount of spiritual growth. That when bad things happen to you, it's not always a sign that God hates you. That dichotomy of righteousness means blessings and wickedness means punishments just is too simplistic for the way the world works. That sometimes bad things can be a sign that God loves you. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Like Elder Scott says, he can be trying to make you better. Now, when it comes to facing adversity, Elder Scott's in the middle and dealing with just having lost his wife. And so these questions come across as really raw. But here's his counsel. He says, when you face adversity, you can be led to ask many questions. Some serve a useful purpose. Others do not. To ask, why does this have to happen to me? Or why do I have to suffer this now? Or what have I done to cause this will lead you into blind alleys. It really does no good to ask questions that reflect opposition to the will of God. 
Now, it's common for us when we're going through some serious trials to ask questions like why and what have I done to cause this? But again, he says those things tend to create blind alleys. They reflect opposition. And by the way, Job is guilty of this. Job does this. He asks why God's punished him. And he does in some ways reflect opposition to the will of God, but he recovers. God comes down and says, I just don't know if you understand everything that's going on, Job, but I want you to know that you agreed to this and that this was part of the parcel of what you're going to experience on earth. I'm sorry it's tough right now, but hang in there. And Job continually refers to this theme where he knows it is going to get better. Now, Elder Scott's counsel, rather than asking those why and what did I do wrong questions, he said, rather ask, what am I to do? What am I to learn from this experience? What am I to change? Whom am I to help? How can I remember my many blessings in times of trial? Willing sacrifice of deeply held personal desires in favor of the will of God is very hard to do. Yet when you pray with real conviction, please let me know thy will and may thy will be done. You are in the strongest position to receive maximum help from your father in heaven. Now, that is a poignant thing. But he does point out that there are closed-ended questions like, why is this happening to me? God doesn't answer that question for Job. Instead, Elder Scott steers us towards questions that lead us outward and cause us to do good. What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to be learning? What should I change? Who am I supposed to help? And how can I remember my blessings in the midst of these trials? Those things point us back to God and reflect alignment with the will of God. The ultimate example of this is the Savior going through the worst trial a person's endured. He goes into the Garden of Gethsemane, kneels down, and actually prays and asks Father in heaven to let the cup pass from him. If it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. But the most important act of the Savior's life come next when he says, nevertheless, not as I will but what thou wilt. The Savior's action reflects alignment with the will of God, not opposition to it. And those questions Elder Scott's saying, like we ask, what am I supposed to learn from this? Or who is this going to allow me to help? Reflect alignment with the will of God. Not us questioning why this happened, but us figuring out, well, what comes next? And what do I do to make this into a learning experience? Now, Job also repents. Uh, If you go to the very last chapter of Job, uh, Job sits down and thinks deeply about what God has just said to him. And this is his humble response. Uh, Verse two, I know that thou canst do everything and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel from such knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, and now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore, I abhor myself, and repent in dust and ashes. So Job has that moment where in the midst of all these discussions with his friends, and by the way, his friends also get reproved by God. God basically says, hey, all this stuff you're doing with Job, not helpful, not helpful. And Job sits down and says, maybe I see you a little bit better. Maybe I understand that I don't always get what's going on in my life, but I don't see things from your perspective. And that brief glimpse where we saw things eye to eye is enough for me. I don't have to know the whole plan of my life or all the ups and downs. It's enough for me to know that you see me and you understand me and you know where I am and what I'm supposed to do. Likewise, the same thing. I can think of countless examples. Uh, Richard G. Scott, Joseph Smith in Liberty Jail. Uh, When Joseph Smith asks, oh God, where art thou? And why, why have you caused this calamity to come upon the saints? God answers question one, I'm with you. But he doesn't answer question two, why has this calamity come upon Joseph Smith and the saints? He just says, all these things shall give thee experience and shall be for thy good. It's very, very rare that we get a black and white answer to why things happen to us in this life. And that's because the answers aren't always meant to come in this life. We'll know in the next life everything. And God emphasizes to Job that before we came to this life, we knew, we knew we may not have fully comprehended what we're going to go through, but the Lord, the best he could 
without giving us direct experience of explaining and trying to prepare us for the journey that we were about to go on. If we trust in the Lord, if we have faith in him, he will eventually give us the answers to our questions. And if we trust in his timing, we'll eventually get to where we need to be. Now, the book of Job ends with this beautiful little epilogue, and it doesn't really give us, like I said, the reasons why, except that God gave Job everything back. Job passed the test. Uh, it says in verse 12 of the very last chapter, in the latter, uh, the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 she asses, donkeys. And he also had seven sons and three daughters. Now, if you were keeping score, um, Job's blessings at the end of this are greater than they are at the beginning. He has double the number of sheep. He has double the number of camels. He has double the number of oxen, double the number of donkeys. But there is a little discrepancy here. Job started out having seven sons and three daughters. Those children lost their lives. At the end of the book, Job doesn't end up with 14 sons and six daughters. He receives seven sons and three daughters. And from the Latter-day Saint perspective, I think the reason why his possessions are doubled, but not his children, is because he never really lost those children. Uh, families are eternal. And if Job is righteous, then in the next life, he will have those seven sons and three daughters back. And now seven more sons and three more daughters to add to his posterity that eventually is going to become numerous. We don't think that he ever lost his children because death isn't the end. They were never really taken away from him, nor could they ever be. Job's faithfulness had ensured that his family would be together and endure together forever. Now, I hope that you enjoy the book of Job. This is, like I said, not a book with easy answers, but that's part of what separates the Old Testament and frankly, just the Christian canon of scripture. And uh, by that, I'm adding in the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, the Pearl of Great Price, because there's stories like Abraham and Joseph Smith and Liberty Jail that are just as pointed as the Book of Job, but don't always point us towards these easy one word, yep, this is why this is happening to you. Sometimes when a person's suffering, we do what Job's three friends do. We just go and sit with them and let them know that we love them and we don't don't try right away to answer it. Sometimes when we have the wrong answers and we make the world a little bit more simple than it actually is, we need to repent in sackcloth and ashes like Job and his three friends and Elihu all did and acknowledge that we might not see the big picture or very simple, understand God's timing. Very, very basically and simply, like Elder Christofferson said, we can't just think of God as a divine vending machine. Someone that's there just to bless us exactly with what we want and when we want it, but someone that cares about us and that realizes that giving us exactly what we want when we want it isn't always the best thing for us. Life is a little bit more complicated than that. And from our limited perspective, we can't always understand why God does everything that he does. But if we trust in God and we have faith in him, we can come to understand and know that he has our best interests in mind and that everything that happens to us has a purpose that will eventually be made known to us either in this life or in the next life. There have been times in my life when I have sought a blessing and not received it. There have been devastating professional and personal setbacks in my life when I just felt like there was nobody there for me. And I went through the same cycle that they go through in the book of Job, where I was trying to explain everything away with that simplistic dichotomy that the righteous get blessings and the wicked get punishments. Life is a lot more complex than that. And now, far removed from some of those events, I can see exactly what I was supposed to learn. There's some events that I'm still trying to figure out and understand and comprehend. But like Job, I know that my Redeemer lives. And I know that no matter what happens, one day I'll stand on the earth and in my flesh, I will see God and know and comprehend all things. Just because we don't know the whole picture, just because we only have a part of the puzzle, doesn't mean that there isn't a greater and grand design. For a person of faith, God has a plan, and God knows who we are, watches over us, and will bless us and help us along our way. 
I want to end with my sincere testimony that the Lord knows exactly who you are. He knows exactly what you're going through. If he can handle the whole complexity of running the universe, then assisting you in your own little universe isn't that much of a problem. It's never been a question of, does God see us? It's, do we see his hand in our life? And can we have patience and faith with him? The reason why faith is the first principle of the gospel is because there's no way we can have or even comprehend all the answers that are out there. So we trust God and believe in better things to come. And eventually we'll have and receive those things. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, thank you very much uh, for being with me. I hope that you enjoyed these podcasts. I hope that you'll share them with your friends, like, and subscribe. And I also hope that you're enjoying your study of the Old Testament. It's a beautiful, big, ugly, complex book <laughs> that doesn't present a lot of easy answers. But that's one of the reasons why I love it so much is because it's a little bit messy. My name's Casey Griffiths, and I'm happy to have been with you during this time. I hope that you have a good week and that you draw closer to God through your studies of the scriptures. And I will see you next time we meet.